Hi there, thanks for checking the video. Check the timeline in the video if you'd like to skip this part, but before we begin, I wanted to chime in. These videos have always been meant to be what I understand a story to be, not a definitive answer to anything. I could be wrong, I could be right, it's storytelling. And I'm glad to bring a blind playthrough perspective because that's what these videos stem from. I go into a video game for the first time and try to tell the story as I understood it, using my own lore discoveries in-game and occasionally official lore book or guide releases from game devs. So if I say something you don't like, please don't take it as a challenge against you. It's okay if we saw the story in different ways. I'm not here to pick a fight. And such an amazing little community is forming around here, so please join us in the conversation. Join the live streams as we talk about and discover new stories, and we fight over whether chocolate and cheese go together. You are welcome here as a friend. Now, the Silent Hill series is difficult to timeline out. I got lucky with Silent Hill 4's clean timeline, but I don't think this story is meant to be bound to definitive years. At least, that's what I'm telling myself in an effort to save my sanity. There are too many inconsistencies between dev teams and media releases. If you saw Masahiro Ito's Silent Hill 2 tweet in January this year, then you'll know what I mean. So this story is just going to be that story. I want to stray away from being an explanation channel. I want to talk about lore. I want to talk about story. So that's what we're going to do. Also, this is actually my second Silent Hill video. My introduction to the series was Silent Hill 4. So I'll tend to refer back to Silent Hill 4 to, to make sense of characters and events. Playing Silent Hill 4 actually gave me a massive advantage in understanding the first three games without spoiling or ruining anything. So link in the corner or in the description if you want to check that out first. And this video is actually meant to be the combined stories of Silent Hill 1 and 3, but wouldn't you know, there is just way too much story to get through in one video. So next week will be Silent Hill 3, and then we'll circle back to the standalone story of Silent Hill 2. Anyways, thanks, thanks for hearing me out, and enjoy the video. The small town of Silent Hill is the quintessential sleepy, quiet resort town. At least on the surface it is. Let's go way, way back to pre-18th century America. In fact, let's go back to the early 1600s. Before it was taken by English settlers, the place we know as Silent Hill was home to an unfortunately unnamed Native American tribe or nation. On these lands, rituals were conducted. This was a holy place, a sacred place. The lands possessed a mysterious power and was called the Place of the Silent Spirits. In the latter part of the century, shortly before 1700, European settlers began to move into the territory and push the indigenous out. But after the passage of a few decades, well, an epidemic began to sweep through the settlement. It was an illness which was unexplainable and so efficient that the place was abandoned by white settlers. It wasn't until the early 1800s, nearly a century later, that settlers returned. But it was resettled as a penal colony after the War of 1812 began. The place was dubbed Silent Hill, and the Silent Hill Prison and Brookhaven Hospital were built. According to stories told within Silent Hill, so many people had died during the initial epidemic, and this weighed so heavily upon the prisoners and inhabitants of the newly formed Silent Hill that it began to distort the mysterious power bestowed upon the land by the native people. In the 1830s, the forceful removal of Native Americans from the area began, which would push the Native Americans into organizing resistances against the residents of Silent Hill. Two decades later, the Silent Hill prison was closed, no longer needed, and a coal field was discovered, breathing new life into the once penal colony. This boom within Silent Hill lasted for a while, about a decade, until 1861, when the Civil War began. A camp was created near Toluca Lake at Silent Hill, a prisoner of war camp. By the war's end in 1865, the camp was converted into a new prison, the Toluca Prison. It was around 1890 that some deeply troubling, unexplainable things began to happen. The organized resistance of the Native Americans against the settlers of Silent Hill ended, and then people began disappearing. The coal field was running dry. Toluca Prison was closed down. 
and combined with these strange disappearances, the future of Silent Hill was not looking bright, not at all. So at the turn of the 20th century, efforts began to turn Silent Hill into a tourist destination. Despite a troubling past and some unexplainable current events, the area was still beautiful and quaint from the outside, an approachable little town that people could vacation at if advertised and funded properly. Toluca Lake became a sightseeing destination with hiking trails and parks and picnic areas and boat tours. But in 1918, a boat called the Little Baroness went missing on the lake. Notice I said went missing. It was eventually determined to be at the bottom of the lake. Notice I didn't say found at the bottom of the lake, but investigations into the event were simply summed up with it most likely sunk for some reason. Despite an extensive police search, not a single fragment of the ship nor any of the 14 bodies of passengers or crew has ever been recovered to this day. And this wasn't the only time this happened with a boat on the lake. The unexplainable events brought a dark reputation to Silent Hill and it began to decline in popularity as a tourist attraction. It certainly wasn't a death blow to the town or its economy. The town persisted after the tragedies, but it kept Silent Hill as stunted, low population. A hotel, a resort, and an amusement park were eventually built. The old Toluca Lake prison was converted into the Silent Hill Historical Society. A school system was established, and orphanage came to be. Though the more conservative members of the community quite disliked influxes of new citizens. Now, that's a very basic background to the town of Silent Hill. And some of you may be saying, but Tiptoe, you haven't even once mentioned the most important part, the order. Good ears. High fives all around. During the Salem Witch Trials, which began in about 1692, one of the victims of the era was Jennifer Carroll. Now, I don't know much about St. Jennifer, except that she was important in the foundation of the order, and her death at the hands of the Christians made her a martyr. This gives some insight as to the root beliefs of the order. There is no religion that has remained unchanged from the moment it was founded. This one is no exception. When this religion fell into the hands of immigrants, it was deeply influenced by their own original Christian beliefs. For example, the traditional representatives of these primal gods may be given the names and descriptions of Christian angels, thus shared characteristics begin to appear. Christian beliefs intertwined with the religion of the native people, sprinkling in some Mayan and Aztec traditions, creating a fledgling version of the order. It remained a highly secretive and elusive organization throughout its maturation into what it eventually became, what we would recognize the order to be in the 1900s. The spirits and deities of this land didn't leave with the expulsion of the Native Americans, they found a new worship within the order. The order would give worship to the one that they called God, represented in female form and with a mythos all its own in the creation of mankind and lesser heavenly beings to aid God in her reign over man. Of a few of these deities, we know of Zuchilbara, the red god, Lobos Vith, the yellow god, Zuchipaba, the unknown deity, Metatron, who in Christian mythology acts as the mouthpiece of God, and Valtiel, who acts as the manservant of God. Assuming that there's no name overlap and these four known entities are all independent of one another, it's Valtiel who seems to have the most direct interaction with those within the order, overseeing young women who may harbor God, returning life to, to those who carry out God's will, those who might bring about the, the apocalypse, Apocal okay, hold on, hold on, let's not, let's not, let's not, let's not get too crazy here. I mean, let's not get ahead of ourselves. George Rostin ushered Valtiel into Walter Sullivan when he was a boy, and Walter Sullivan totally committed suicide in prison in 1991 and was brought back to life by Valtiel and the order to carry out the assumption of the 21 sacraments. That's why his coffin was empty and his disheveled corpse was in the storage room after he ascended to the other world. It was Valtiel. It was Valtiel, and I'll fight for this lore. <clears throat> Sorry, the crazy gets out sometimes. So, the order as we know it 
What was the purpose of their worship? What, what do they believe? What do they desire? Well, God gifted mankind with time, the day and the night, mortality and the angels. God wished to create a paradise for mankind where mere existence would be bliss. But God's strength ran out and death came to God. In her last breath, she promised that she would return. And with her return, the path to that paradise would be open to all who lived in faith and an apocalypse would consume earth. The order didn't really have a uniform presence in Silent Hill until the dawn of the 20th century, suspiciously just a few decades before the boat tragedies began. Though even with its organization, it still lurked in the shadows of Silent Hill. What interactions the Order did have with the local community were not pleasant, which makes sense, as the Order adopted some particularly brutal practices to keep its flock in line and to assert some sort of control over the general community of Silent Hill. Locals took to referring to the hushed-up religion as a cult. Slowly, over the course of decades, members of the Order crept into positions of importance within the town, giving them clandestine influence over the area and increasing their membership numbers. So bold they became that when a committee was established to overhaul the image of Silent Hill to make it more approachable as a tourist destination, some very timely, targeted, and unfortunate deaths began. Though the order was recognized as the defining name of the religion, it was composed of at least three sects. Though they all acted in different ways, their goal was the same bring about the return of God, usher on the apocalypse, and therefore deliver the believers of the order on to paradise. Of these three known sects, we have the sect of the Holy Mother, which we know eventually came to operate the wish house and oversaw the indoctrination of children for their own uses. Through rituals and summonings, they desired to return God to earth through a conjurer. The sect of Valtiel, headed by Jimmy Stone, who eventually became the first victim of Walter Sullivan. The sect of Valtiel held this manservant of God in reverence and therefore acted in whatever way was necessary to achieve the overall goals of the order, even if it meant assisting the other sects of the order with their goals. Then another sect, whose name I could not find, who wished to usher God back to life through rebirth using a daughter of the order as a religious incubator who will birth God back into the world. I'll call this the sect of rebirth, though if you know the name of this particular sect, please let me know. About the mid-1930s to mid-1940s, a woman named Dahlia Gillespie was born, and her childhood isn't really important, but what she became is. She was an ardent believer in the faith of the Order. She eventually rose to power and became a priestess of the Order, leading what we're calling today as the Sect of Rebirth. Sometime in the late 1960s, Dahlia gave birth to a girl she named Alessa. There's no talk of the father, it's just Dahlia and Alessa. And from a very young age, Alessa was different, not in a quirky, awkward way. No she had subtle, psychic-like powers. Ghosts and apparitions seemed to appear when Alessa was around. Her mother, Dahlia, was a powerful priestess within the Order, capable of using magics and rituals, so it would make sense that some of this power was passed on to Alessa. But the girl was tormented by her peers at school for being a witch, and Dahlia was unspeakably cruel to her. Beatings, imprisonments, failed indoctrinations, Dahlia meant to use Alessa as a vessel, an incubator for the rebirth of God. In all her life, it seems Alessa only really had one friend, a girl her age named Claudia Wolf. It's common within the Order to use torture tactics against children, to force them into compliance and open to their teachings. What Dahlia was doing to Alessa it may have just been what was done to her when she was a child, to some degree. And we'll see this mistreatment of children many times over throughout the history of the Order. When Alessa was seven years old, Dahlia put her ritual into motion within her own home, with only herself present as an authority of the Order, with only herself present should something go wrong. And something certainly did. 
Arguably, perhaps. Perhaps it was intentional, perhaps it wasn't, but Dahlia set the girl on fire. She set the entire house on fire. She set six houses on fire. The ritual was a success, though. Alessa became the human incubator of God. And because of this, she could not die. Her suffering was immediate and extreme. A child left to burn, to suffocate without oblivion, her skin to break, her nerves to melt. The only way that she could cope, the only way she could stop her mother, was to split her soul into two while she laid on the burning ritual site. Taking the form of a baby, half her spirit was sent away, set upon a roadside to be chanced upon by Harry Mason and his wife. The couple adopted the baby and raised her in a loving home. When Harry's wife died, little Cheryl became the center of Harry's world. But for Alessa, at Alcamila Hospital, a life of agony and torture carried on, but anew. She couldn't die. The god that laid in her womb couldn't grow with only half her soul present. Alessa fought her role in this process. She fought against this god fetus inside of her. But Dahlia would not allow her any peace. Alessa was kept in the basement of the Alcamila Hospital, under the secretive care of Dr. Michael Kaufman. Though Dr. Kaufman wasn't a cult member, he worked with Dahlia and provided his services to the Order. You see, Silent Hill had a bit of a drug trafficking problem. A local flower called the White Claudia was used to make something called PTV. This drug, though illegal, was used recreationally by tourists and some of the local population, as well as by the Order, for religious purposes, as it was a powerful hallucinogenic. Dr. Kaufman supplied PTV to an addict, a nurse named Lisa Garland. He used it to control her, kept her hooked on it, and then forced Lisa to care for Alessa in secret. It was a form of control and blackmail on Lisa. And what had happened to Alessa greatly disturbed her. She couldn't understand what was keeping the girl alive, how this could be happening to a child. Under the direct care of Dr. Kaufman, and Dahlia. Alessa was stored in the basement of that hospital for seven years. Lisa Garland was blackmailed into tending to her for seven years. Dahlia made sure that Alessa was kept in a state of constant pain, which made the girl's apparent psychic abilities much more powerful over time. Dahlia cast spells over Alessa to try and compel the other half of her spirit, the child Cheryl, to return to Silent Hill, to reunite with Alessa and make her whole. But after seven years of this, Dr. Kaufman became fed up with the lack of payoff for himself. He didn't seem to care over some god or paradise, but he expected his services to the Order would have garnered him some sort of reward, which never came. Dahlia and Dr. Kaufman eventually had a falling out of some sort. In a silent retaliation, Dr. Kaufman procured a substance called Agliophotis, something known within the Order to expel or guard against demons. He theorized that this could act as a, as a god abortion drug, should he ever feel the need to end Dahlia's scheming. After seven years, Alessa called to her other half. Cheryl called her back to Silent Hill. She intends to unite herself into one form once again and plant anchors around Silent Hill within her other world. Beasts monstrous things that tether the other world to her. They represent stories and experiences from her childhood brought into form within the other world. She intends to remove Silent Hill from the normal waking world of mankind, then bind her whole self there where she is powerful and end her life, ending the threat of God's rebirth, stopping the order, and finally finding peace in death. At Cheryl's request, Harry Mason takes Cheryl to Silent Hill for a vacation. On the outskirts of the town, a projection of Alessa walking on the road causes Harry to wreck his jeep, cold clocking him into unconsciousness. When he awakens, he's not quite in the other world, but in a foggy, broken reality of Silent Hill, the creation of Alessa. We've now made it to the beginning of Silent Hill 1. Now, 
the graphics of the PlayStation 1 do do a fine job in telling the story of Silent Hill 1 and bringing its characters to life. But for a moment, if you would, take it a step further with me. Put yourself into Harry's shoes. You're driving. You get into a wreck. The person that you love most in the world is in the vehicle. When your awareness and thought returns to you after the impact, that person is gone. You don't see blood in the car, at least not theirs, thank God, but their door is open, so did somebody take them? Are they injured, and did they wander off? Would an animal attack them? All this fog, would someone see them on the road? How long has it been? Why are there no emergency services coming to help? You call out for this person, the person that you love most in the world, but all you get back is silence. For me, there's nothing I wouldn't do to find that person, and I believe that's a sentiment everyone can get behind. But when the seeming paranormal gets involved, when the world around you changes, would you run headfirst into hell itself to find that person that you love the most? Harry Mason sure did. It was immediately clear that something within what Harry thought was Silent Hill was wrong. The fog obfuscated sight, it was apparently snowing, and the streets were completely abandoned. Harry sees his girl off in the distance, Cheryl, just barely, but she doesn't race for him like one might expect. She runs away, leading him on some sort of chase through the streets. Down a road, into an alley he goes, past the eviscerated carcass of, of something, and it becomes darker and darker and darker yet. But Harry doesn't stop. Past a bloodied stretcher, it doesn't matter. Into a gore-splattered dead end, it doesn't matter. Where a fresh corpse seems to hang, where darkness falls in its entirety. Where beings emerge from the shadows to take him, and the call of the other world fills the descending gloom as Harry Mason is taken down. Oh, but don't worry, he's not dead yet. Harry awakens in a small diner, with an officer, Sybil Bennett, overseeing him. Seems the sleepy town of Silent Hill has been suspiciously quiet as of late, and Officer Bennett is here to do some investigating. Depending on your outlook, she's either here at the perfect time or the worst possible time imaginable. Officer Bennett is one of those rare people that doesn't conceal information or withhold truths. She's honest with Harry from the start as to what she's doing in Silent Hill, the weirdness that she's observed, and what she intends to do, call for reinforcements. She even gives Harry a weapon, a gun, before she heads back out into the oppressive fog. Harry is guided by Cheryl slash Alessa to the Midwich Elementary School. In this, this half-baked reality that Silent Hill now resides in because of Alessa, the school is decrepit and dirty. Little monsters roam the halls, and strange puzzles keep passages secret. Stranger still, when Harry finds his way through these seemingly misplaced puzzles, he's given passage through a clock tower in the courtyard of the school. And through this hidden tunnel within the clock tower, Harry emerges on the other side, but still within the Midwich Elementary School. But the blood-splattered, rusted-out bastardization of it within the other world... A strange occultic symbol is painted in the courtyard. Corpses hang from the walls, rotted within cages. Monsters roam the halls and classrooms, and threats call out to him from forbidden areas. But a phone call from his daughter asking where he is keeps Harry true to his task. He finds his way through to one of Alessa's monsters, one of her anchors for this horrific other world. But don't you worry. Harry has plenty of ammo to handle the situation. And with the death of this monstrous thing, the other world fades away, back to the foggy, decrepit school he originally entered. In his return, Harry sees a girl, a teenager, leaning against a boiler. It's Alessa, though he doesn't know who or what she is. She looks at him, holds his gaze for a moment, and then vanishes away. He made it through the school, through the other world and back, but he's no closer to having his daughter back. 
no closer to answering the mystery of this place. However, the bells of a church off in the distance hearken to him. There, within the Balkan church, Harry Mason meets Dahlia Gillespie. Though Dahlia is quite coy in this encounter. She seems to be a godly woman, a kind woman, though a bit weird. She speaks in riddles of sorts, but she acts as though she wants to help Harry get Cheryl back. Dahlia knows who and what Cheryl is. She wants Cheryl to return to Alessa so that Dahlia can see through the birth of God. Dahlia is also aware of what Alessa is trying to do to set up. These anchors of the other world, this thing she's trying to do with Silent Hill, Dahlia wants to stop it. Turning this all to her advantage would be very easy. All she needs is for Harry Mason, the loving father who would do anything for his child, to kill those anchors so that Dahlia can take control of Alessa. Out of the kindness of her heart, Dahlia gives Harry something called the Flaros and guides Harry on to the Alcamilla Hospital. At the hospital, Harry actually meets Dr. Kaufman, who is also trapped within this foggy, dangerous version of Silent Hill and who is ready to shoot anything that moves. Seems Harry is the first person he's seen since the fog fell. Kaufman isn't outright manipulative and deceptive like Dahlia. In fact, he seems pretty confused as to what's going on as well. But when it comes to sharing information, he's the absolute opposite of Officer Sybil Bennett. He just sort of tells Harry that he's, he's sorry his daughter is missing, and then he excuses himself from the room. But when Harry goes to Kaufman's office, there's this strange red substance spilled on the floor. Hmm. Harry has no idea what it is, but takes a sample of it for prosperity. But you do. Don't you? You remember what it is. Go ahead, I'll give you a second. Did you remember? It's the Agliophotus, that demon abortion drug Kaufman procured as a backup plan if Dahlia ever needed to be stopped. Harry has no idea what it is, though. But when you're traveling the foggy, monster-riddled streets of Silent Hill, it's probably best to hoard whatever resources and occult liquids you can carry. Harry is once again pulled into the other world within the hospital, and in the bowels of the building, Harry comes across Alessa's sick room, where she was locked away and tended to by Dr. Kaufman, Nurse Lisa Garland, and Dahlia. At the bedside is a picture of the girl, Alessa, and not far away is Lisa Garland, hiding under a desk. Clearly, the woman is terrified and clings to Harry before even saying a word to him. The two share words for a little while. Lisa is unaware of what's going on in the basement of the storeroom, the place Alessa has been kept for the last seven years. She says that they were under strict order to not enter the hospital basement. And you may want to engage your inner phoenix right and pull out your objection card to Lisa's statement, but something deeper is at play here. Lisa is not in the foggy, snowing version of the reality-bent Silent Hill. No, she was found within the other world, the blood-rusted place where monsters roam, the barbed-wired creation of Alessa's power. She's not being dishonest, she just doesn't remember some things yet. We'll get there soon enough. During their conversation, Harry is removed from the other world back to the fog reality of Silent Hill and, well, 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 look who's here, it's Dahlia, here to help Harry along on his way to find his precious daughter, though she insists on speaking in vague, riddling sentences that just don't make any sense to Harry. She's the apparent authority of the goings-ons in the town, though, so when she tells Harry about the mark of Samael, the seal that he saw in the courtyard of the Otherworld at the school, he doesn't doubt her when she tells him, it cannot be completed Samael. Well, that's, that's another name for the devil, for Satan, for a demon. Though within the Order, it's truly known as the Seal of Metatron. The Seal of Metatron is only as powerful as the person who wields it, if you or I had the Seal of Metatron, it would probably just be a talisman. Not that I don't doubt you and your majesticness, just it would be pretty useless. But in the hands of a powerful being like Alessa, why? It could plunge all of Silent Hill permanently into the other world. It could remove Silent Hill from reality altogether. By destroying the monsters that Alessa has created, those anchors, the seals placed around Silent Hill are destroyed. 
Harry thinks that by doing this, he is helping stop the darkness taking over Silent Hill. And in a way, he sort of is in the short term, but he's really just helping Dahlia stop Alessa's planned suicide. Helping Dahlia usher God into the world. She directs Harry towards another church, giving him a key to an antique shop. Dahlia's antique shop, from what I can gather. He meets up with Officer Sybil Bennett again, who tells him that she's seen a girl matching Cheryl's description near Toluca Lake, though she got away from Officer Bennett. She wasn't really running, and the road she was on had been destroyed. It was, it was more like the kid was walking on air, and Sybil just couldn't get to her. Hmm. Probably nothing, right? Harry goes to the hidden worship room of the antique shop alone, finding a sordid altar of sorts. But here, Harry disappears, back into the other world, back to the presence of Lisa Garland at the hospital. The way Lisa reacts to Harry waking up there makes it seem as though Harry never left the area. She says he was having a bad dream. This isn't a question of Harry's perception of time and space, but rather hers. What was she experiencing in this other world in the time that Harry walked within the fog reality of the town? Harry asks her about Dahlia Gillespie, and finally someone is around to give some sort of insight on this woman to Harry. She's crazy, kind of locally famous for being crazy. And when Alessa supposedly died in a fire, Dahlia went full mental mode. This talk of the town being devoured by darkness links to a weird cult, she thinks. The town has a really dark underbelly to it, and as the younger generation of Silent Hill left the town behind, the religious fanatics chose to believe that instead they'd been summoned away by angels. Though, in truth, there was nothing to keep a younger generation within the town. There was no college, no bustling economy, at least not before the resort was built. The religious fanatics just chose to believe that the young people were leaving because they'd been summoned to do so, and when new people began to arrive, new outsider residents and tourists, it drove the fanatics into deeper secrecy and deeper into their own fervent beliefs. It's a nice bit of flavor and insight into Silent Hill from an actual resident. Sure enough, halfway through their conversation, Harry goes out cold again and wakes up in the still, blood-rusted other world, but back in the antique shop on top of a seal of Metatron. Just what the heck happened here? His only way forward is through the shopping center where he finds another of those monstrous anchors, those creations of Alessa, though killing the beast this time doesn't stop the other world. Uh-oh. It seems that the other world is really starting to seep in to take over, and that can't be positive, can it? The only lead he has here, the only guiding light, is Lisa Garland back at the hospital. So, on foot, through the dangers of the other world, Harry plunges back into the darkness, back to the hospital, back to Lisa Garland. Though this time, it seems that she has observed Harry's disappearance and was quite worried over him. Officer Bennett said that Cheryl had been seen near the lake, but the roads have been destroyed, so Lisa is his only hope in reaching it. Does, does she know some back road, some secret that he can take? Well, she doesn't know of any back roads, but she does know of a water station near the school with underground tunnels. The, she doesn't want him to go. She's so afraid to be alone. She begs him to stay. When Harry offers to take her along with him instead, she declines. She feels like she's not supposed to leave this place. But why is she here? Why can't she seem to remember? Another seal of Metatron is nearby, which means another monstrous beast must be fought. Thankfully, after putting this monster moth down, the world shifts back to the familiar foggy town of the other Silent Hill, where Harry can get passage to the waterworks. Though, on the other side of the blockaded road near the lake, it's become quite dark, concerningly dark. The other world isn't here, at least not yet, but it is pitch black outside. Harry stumbles around for a while, and eventually he comes across Dr. Kaufman again, who's just about to have his giblets gobbled up in a bar by a beast. Kaufman still isn't coming clean with Harry about anything. Maybe he still doesn't quite believe it to be relevant, or maybe it's self-preservation. He reasons that by now, a military convoy is definitely en route to save them, and 
Anytime now, they'll be rolling in for sure. Definitely. Hey, Dr. Kaufman, would you happen to know a girl named Alessa by chance? Harry asked, not, not me, of course. And we know the answer to that question. But even now, Kaufman claims he doesn't have any idea who Alessa is. He doesn't even skip a beat either. He is a very convincing liar. He also accidentally drops a key on the ground before he leaves, a key to a motel room nearby. Oh, I wonder what could be in there. Well, inside the room, there's another key hidden under some floorboards, and that key is to a motorcycle. Hmm, okay. Well, while at the motorcycle, Harry notices that it's dusty and it's unused. Nothing special, except the gas tank has been dusted and messed with. Oh, interesting, what's in the gas tank? Oh, it's a plastic baggie. Well, what's in the baggie? Oh, it's a red vial of some sort. Could that be more agliophotis, more demon abortion liquid? And who should roll into the garage but Kaufman himself and tells Harry off, takes the vial and stomps out of the garage? I wonder if he'll be using that later for something. En route to the pier, something most troubling begins right in front of Harry's eyes. The other world starts to seep into the foggy reality of Silent Hill. Reality starts becoming the nightmare. Harry really doesn't have much time left. If the other world doesn't claim him, then Alessa's destruction of Silent Hill will, or Dahlia's release of the god within Alessa will. Harry really doesn't have much time to spare right now whether he realizes just how dire things are or not. There are many, many ways that this could go poorly for him. Officer Sybil Bennett and Harry Mason meet once again on the pier, sharing information and forming a plan. Harry recognizes the other world for what it is now, the nightmarish imagining of someone or something, and its invasion of reality will continue if uncontested. Cheryl is there, wherever this is originating from. He just, he just knows that she is, somehow. And then Dahlia decides to show up again. Both she and Alessa are close to completing their own goals. But only one will be able to sway the fine details of the coming events to fulfill their desire. There are two seals left. They both have to be destroyed to stop Alessa, or the demon, as Dahlia puts it to Harry and Sybil. Harry will need to keep that Floris ready to use on the demon. It can stop the demon. So, the two split up. Harry goes to the lighthouse. Sybil Bennett goes to the Lakeside Amusement Park. Atop the lighthouse is a huge depiction of the seal of Metatron, though there's no anchoring beast to be found, no monster to fight. Instead, it's just a projection of Alessa Gillespie, standing, waiting for him. And then she fades away. Harry was too late to stop this anchor, to stop this seal from taking full form. Back on the pier, the situation only gets worse. Sybil Bennett has not returned from the amusement park. Harry braves the descending other world and the smothering darkness to search for her, only to find that something terrible has happened to Sybil Bennett at the park. She rises from a wheelchair stationed atop a carousel platform, with red eyes and a blank expression. She draws her weapon on Harry, intent on killing him. Thankfully, Remember that little bottle Harry collected back at Dr. Kaufman's office? The Agliophotus? Well, now is the time. Drive whatever has taken Sybil Bennett out. Save her life. Just like I... I didn't do. God, Sybil, I'm so sorry. I just got a little savage. I tried to save her with my bullets and it didn't quite pan out. You know what that was? That was a my bad. That was a my bad. After Sybil's fate is determined... Alessa reappears. Harry begs her just to let Cheryl go, to let her leave with him. But Alessa is having none of it and easily pushes the man away from her. As she walks away, however, the Floros activates and seems to attack Alessa with a single shot it takes her down. And from the shadows comes Dahlia, finally coming clean about Alessa's relationship to her, finally pulling back the veil, so to speak, talking to the girl as though she were little more than a pest playing a game. Though she'd underestimated how powerful Alyssa had become, the hit from the Floros would keep her weakened enough for Dahlia to once again control her. And now, now was the time to unite her spirit back into one being and bring about the rebirth of God. Dahlia takes the girl, and Harry finds himself once again 
with Lisa Garland, but in a place called Nowhere. And after some travels through Nowhere alone, Harry returns to Lisa, and she remembers. And she knows why everyone is dead, but she's still walking around. She's the same as those creatures. Dead. A part of this place. A creation of Alessa's nightmare. She just hadn't realized it yet, but now she does. And now it's her turn to join this other world. But even with this realization, she's terrified and she doesn't want to be alone. Harry flees from the bleeding, weeping woman, not out of malice, but out of fear, and closes the door behind him as she sobs and wails alone. As Harry continues on through this nowhere, he sees parts of Alessa's past and understands how this came to be, who is responsible, what their goals are, just how insidious and vile Dahlia Gillespie is, and what she did to Alessa in service to herself, her ego, and her religion. When the final confrontation comes, all the cards are on the table. With the reunion of Alessa and Cheryl's soul, the incubator of the god is restored. God will one day be birthed from this being, the world will meet in apocalypse, and paradise will be gifted to the faithful of the order. And now's the time when Dr. Kaufman decides that he should intervene. Things seem to be getting a little bit out of control, so he shoots Dahlia and chucks a vial of Agliophotus at the incubator, forcing a demon-like figure out of its body. The imagining of what Alessa believed this god to be looks quite like a devil, doesn't it? Its first order of business is to end Dahlia Gillespie. Then it turns its attention to Harry. One final showdown for Harry Mason. He fights this incubus demon, bringing down the fledgling newborn god. The other world begins to crumble upon its death. The final pieces of Alessa, the incubator, imparts to Harry a gift and a request. A child. Cheryl is gone and she will never be returned to him. But this child is the rebirth of her, the rebirth of Alessa, but still a new person as well. This child will always be sought by the Order. They will never give up their chase to retrieve this, this child who holds the potential to rebirth their god. Harry doesn't hesitate in taking her. The incubator opens a way out for him, away from the collapsing other world, back into Silent Hill. Michael Kaufman, too, begins to flee, but is taken down by Lisa Garland, a sweet act of revenge the man sorely deserved. With a now baby Heather in his arms, Harry Mason flees the town of Silent Hill. When next we meet, we'll speak more about the consequences of this event, the trauma that ate at Harry Mason, and the heartbreak that would test his daughter, Heather Mason. <laughs>